book that's forthcoming. That's forthcoming next uh, year from Oxford University Press. This is actually the second part of the book. The first part of the book deals with the labor market impacts of artificial intelligence. And moreover, uh, we propose uh, various ways of modeling that. So the first part of the book is very much a, a, a microeconomics modeling of AI automation within labor markets. The second part of the book looks a little bit forward to the longer term issues and the issues that economics typically tend to neglect as far as artificial intelligence is concerned. So this paper um, is, is, is actually a, like a part of the book. So it's a hundred page paper. So there's no way that I can in 15 minutes actually go through everything. So I'm just going to give you a kind of like a snapshot of some of the highlights. And then if you're interested, uh, you can follow that in the paper. Um, it's also, um, I think, important to, to note, as I said, this is not a paper, another paper, yet another paper on the labor market impacts of AI. I think we've seen a lot of that, but if you are interested in this, I've just published uh, this paper in the Journal of Labor Market Research Modeling Artificial Intelligence in Economics. And in this paper, we enrich the simple task approach of David Alter, which um, he published in 2013 in the same journal. And this is kind of like being the working horse of looking at automation in uh, and the labor market impacts. And we think this is very, very much not a, a, a really good way of looking at AI because this approach is really working with robotic automation. And with AI, we are looking at software automation. So it's a completely different process. And uh, we, pro we pro provide a model where AI does not substitute for tasks as in the task model, but for abilities. And then with ability, software and data become very important as they are not in robotics. So, you know, all the models of Asimoglu and Restrepo and other authors, they use the task approach, which is not really appropriate for the kind of AI that we see today. And so we, we, we have, we've come up with this new model. And when we stick it into an endogenous growth model, we, we kind of like get the situation that we find in the world today, rapid data driven innovations, but very little impact on, on labor markets in terms of job losses. We have highest employment, you know, before the crisis um, that we've had in a long time. So um, we, we get this kind of like no robocalypse result that um, AI will not destroy our jobs. Um, that is very difficult to get through in, in the sense of the model, but it can lead to stagnation in growth because uh, of demand side type of effects. So moving on to this topic. Um, so in this, in this paper of ours, we say, well, we think that the idea of the short-term impacts of, of, of AI, specifically machine learning on labor markets have been thoroughly investigated in economics, but there are three neglected topics that economists have not so far really done anything uh, about. The first is the so-called idea of a singularity, which refers to a really radical change in the growth mode of an economy. And William Nordhaus um, last year in a paper in American Economic Review, he kind of like lamented the saying that there is so much about robots in economics, but very little on singularity and the mode of economic growth. And so we, we take up this challenge of William Nordhaus and, and tackle the singularity. The second aspect is that artificial intelligence may pose an existential risk. And again, a recent review by Trammell and, and Corey Neck um, again say, you know, pointed to this as a, as a weakness, saying that, well, economists have looked at labor market risk and maybe risk to economic growth and inequality, but very little on existential risk. Largely, this has been left to the philosophers to come up with all kinds of sometimes really bizarre and scientific uh, science fiction type of scenarios of the end of the world. And to a large extent in my paper, I, I, I point out that philosophers, they apply to a certain extent the same decision theory framework as economics with the expected utility model. But they apply this sometimes in a very, um, you know, I think inappropriate way, taking from that certain conclusions, um, specifically regarding to things like Pascal's wager and Pascal's mugging, which leads to very strange type of conclusions. Uh, we see this also now in the whole movement of long-termism, uh, which puts so much weight on the future that they are willing to, uh, you know, sacrifice millions of lives today, in, you know, in favor of some future gains. Um, and, and this is something that we say economists must do more about because uh, one may come up with completely strange uh, recommendations uh, if one applies these type of uh, thinking tools wrong. And then finally, there is the so-called AI alignment problem. So how can we get AI to do what we want um, and not destroy uh, our society in the future? 
Um, and this is again something as Joshua um, Gans pointed out, economists have not really been working on the AI alignment problem. Again, it's been computer scientists and philosophers that have weighed in on this problem. And uh, again, I think they have made perhaps a little bit more of the AI alignment problem. If I look at the way in which utility functions are specified in AI models and reinforcement learning, I certainly see a small world, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the words of, of Savage, if we think about Bayesian statistics and decision making, these are small world problems where you very rarely have alignment problems. So I think again, uh, philosophers uh, can, can see problems where it perhaps may not exist. So in our paper, we look at these three neglected topics. And so firstly, let me say something about the singularity. So the singularity is just this idea that there will be an intelligence explosion and that our current narrow AI, which is just based on machine learning, so statistics and a little bit of machine learning, will somehow lead to an artificial general intelligence, would be human-like intelligence, and that eventually this would even become an artificial superintelligence. So this is based on what is called the deep learning scaling up hypothesis. So deep learning is currently the dominant paradigm in AI. And it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's all kinds of other types of AI uh, methods. It's leaving that in the dust. It solves problems that, can, that have not been solved before. Often we don't know why, um, but the belief is that it can be scaled up to human level intelligence. Once that happens, uh, we, could, we could conceive as um, Chalmers have pointed out, uh, a machine that creates more machines and these machines are creating even more intelligent machines. So you have a, a scaling up effect, a snowball effect, which could lead to an explosion in intelligence as a singularity. And this is a point, as, as Vernon Vinch pointed out, where our models must be discarded. We don't know how the economy will look like after such an intelligence explosion. Uh, and if, in fact, this idea of a singularity goes back to, to Good's paper in 1965, where he, where he talked about the self recursive self-improvement by intelligent machines, which would lead to a type of intelligence explosion known as the singularity. So the point is that we, we don't know what will happen to the economy after the singularity. Um, and, and as a result, there are, there are various um, types of, of, of um, hypotheses and scenarios. And this is a graph that I compiled based on the current, but I think best thinking from computer scientists and philosophers about the pathway of artificial intelligence development now and into the future. So on the, on the vertical axis is the intelligence level of AI. And below, and there on the on the on the bottom left side, we have the human level of intelligence, and we can see that roughly now in 2020, we are be, 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 between the commercial use of narrow AI, so machine learning and statistics, we are moving towards robotic brains, which are expected in the next two or three years, and then there is there is a kind of like an expectation that somehow between 2050 and 2061, there's a 50 percent plus chance that there will be an artificial general intelligence. This will this will start with a seed AI, which becomes recursively self-improving. We don't have it yet, but it's predicted to be around 2030, 2040. And then there would be an hard takeoff. In other words, this would happen so fast once this recursive abilities appear that we would get human level AI. And that would very quickly in a short period of time increase to where we have a singleton, which would be a, a, a one AI basically dominating the planet, as I will explain. And eventually over time, this could be millions of years, this could develop into a mature galactic artificial superintelligence. All of these different steps from the potential threats um, in the terms of a Fritcherous stern or a hidden AGI, all of these are discussed very thoroughly in the scientific literature, right? So I try to stick with what, um, what, what, what computer scientists, uh, physicists, uh, philosophers have been publishing in peer-reviewed journals and not so much uh, in, into science fiction. So although it's sometimes read like science fiction and William Nordhaus have also made the comment that very often there are elements of science fiction and these are all very real scenarios based on real physics and, and, and real uh, science in terms of the possibility. So there are, there are, there are probabilities and not certainties attached to these different types of pathways. So I want to talk now here specifically about the intelligence explosion, the singularity, and then later I'll talk about the singleton and galactic um, ASI type of phase. So the first thing if we talk about the singularity is to compare that to the no artificial general intelligence baseline. What would happen if you would have no artificial intelligence to support economic growth in future? 
This graph tells us world GDP since the year 1000. And you can see this hockey stick. So something happened after 1800 that gave rise to this exponential, actually super exponential growth for most of this time. And endogenous growth theory basically explains this as a positive feedback between population, ideas, and technology. So what we have is we have explosive growth due to uh, an increase in population, which leads to more people having more ideas. This leads to more technology. More technology leads to more growth, which allows the population to expand. And this gives rise to basically this explosive runaway growth. And of course, we have seen in the last 100 years that there has not been explosive growth, but exponential growth. And this is because the, there has been a demographic shift. There has been a fertility has fallen in the West uh, below uh, replacement rates, for instance. And this kind of like breaks the link between the, uh, the positive feedback between population and growth. But it still leads to relatively constant exponential growth, even if it's not uh, uh, ex explosive economic growth. Now, once, what, once we have a demographic uh, changes that are more significant, what will happen if we have no AI? Well, if we do not have um, AI and we have uh, constant population growth, then we will have constant exponential growth. But once we start to have negative population growth, as um, as um, Jones have also shown uh, in his very nice economic growth paper just published in the American Economic Review, we will end up with the empty planet result. We will end up with growth collapsing, right? So this is mathematically shown that you know we will have that. And according to Jones and also the empty planet shock, um, this is also something that I think is, is sometimes surprising. People think we are living in an overpopulated planet and that population pressure is a real problem. Um, the problem is actually that we will run out of enough people very soon. Um, so Jones also showed that with 1% annual decline in population, world GDP growth would drop to zero somewhere between 85 to 250 years from now, right? So, um, so without population growth, we will see, you know, at least in two centuries, we will have no growth anymore possible. We will have no growth scenario. So what AGI will do is AGI will restore both the population and the ideas as drivers of economic growth, right? And According to a recent paper by Davidson, it could result in explosive economic growth of 30% per year, which means that basically almost every two years, the world economy would double. At the moment, the world economy doubles every 35 years. So the expectation is with such an AGI intelligence explosion, uh, you could have a 30% growth doubling the world economy every two years. And this singularity then is an inflection point in a move from the mode of growth so we've had the, the agricultural revolution, which had the mode of growth in the industrial revolution with its mode of growth. And so with AGI, people see a different mode of economic growth. Now, the, the, what happens after this and what these modes of growth are, this is very speculative in the literature so far. So I'm not going to go much in detail. You can read in my paper how I describe this. There are basically three types of scenarios after the singularity. Um, one is called fully automated luxury capitalism. And a lot of people are here talking about having basic income grants to assure that humans will just live and machines will, AI will do the real heavy lifting work. There is also interesting discussion about so-called ascended corporations. So you're all very aware of decentralized autonomous organizations that are now being created. Um, and this could result in robot companies with robot workers owned by robot capitalists using decentralized autonomous organizations. Alexandra has a nice description of how such companies could, could work. And eventually they will monopolize the world. Because if you think about, about the size of companies, the reason companies are big is because as Ronald Kosev said, there are transaction costs, but because they get to a certain level of complexity, humans cannot manage them anymore. It's a control of span with type of problem, but AI would not have any such problem. So there's no limit to the size of companies once it's driven by an AI. And then the optimal would be one large organization dominating all commerce in the world. And then finally, one of the most uh, interesting scenarios is by the economist Robin Hansen called EMS or um, brain, full brain emulations where we upload our brains in, and, and into a computer and we become generally digital people. And the expectation is really that in a specific time period, um, Hansen put a time, time framework of, of, of maybe two or three million years, which in you know, galactic terms is not that long, but that could lead to more digital people than actually humans. And you can read about uh, the different scenarios and how fast the economy would grow. I mean, such a digital economy where growth is basically decoupled from physical resources, uh, the economy may double every two weeks. Uh, in Anson's uh, estimation. So he's written a whole book about this. You can read about it in this, The Age of M. 
Um, more minutes, Gwen. Thanks. Thank you very much. So, so in the final final aspect, which I want to uh, come to, is the singleton uh, or the final uh, existential threat. So, there's really a lot of people believing that AI will lead to an existential threat. In fact, it's seen by even economists like Noy and Ur as the most significant existential threat facing humanity. Uh, right. So. Um, uh, the, 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 the question is, is this real and what is the mechanism? Why would AI pose an existential risk? So there are two things. One is the capability and one is the value claim. Firstly, is that it may be because it's so powerful, it may just even accidentally uh, kill people. But there's also the fact that its values may not be aligned uh, with, uh, with, with humans. And say there is a 1% chance that in the next century, AI will kill humanity, which is what Toby Ort estimated to be. And if you think about the damage, then we should be spending a whole lot of effort on tackling existential risk. But it seems a recent review showed that there is about 300 people working at the moment in the world on the existential risk of AI, which led Sam Harris to say, well, this is, there are more people working in McDonald's in his, in his local town than are focusing on the existential risk of AI. And there's virtually no economist working on the existential risk of AI. Um, so AI could, could pose uh, existential risk by, um, by, for instance, an AI lock-in. So if you have this singleton or this uh, domination of the world economy and you have the values of the AI, then it would basically be stable forever. You know, you would always be this autocracy that you can never change. You know, so think about, think about the worst regime ever in human history and there's no way to change that ever. A second thing is this type of like, you know, what we get in movies, the wire rating, where you have direct simulation of reward centers in the brain. So we are doing this with mice. And so it's quite easy to imagine that in future an AI could just wire rate humans and we would have a, a bad future. This is actually what Axley described in his Brave New World, where people were wire rating themselves. The, the regime who kept them in, in, in place said, well, we're not going to use the face on the boot approach to replace people. We're going to keep people happy and docile all of the time. And this is more likely with an AGI. The first, the first thing in the final minute is uh, just to, to lead up to this final uh, question is the dark forest hypothesis. You can read about um, this as well. So AI could pose a uh, risk because it may be the case that it's not only AI in the, in, 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 on our planet that's a risk, you know, because if we think that AI would lead to AGI on, on our planet, then maybe it's already existed on other planets in the, in the, in the past and, and, and foreign civilizations in, in extraterrestrial terms would actually then be AI. So if we meet aliens ever in the future, and there are very much huge projects now by NASA to look at extraterrestrials, to find them, there would likely be artificial general intelligences. And so these may actually be a more of a threat uh, to humanity than our own AGI. And maybe we need to discover an AGI before we meet an alien artificial general intelligence. So on that topic, I, I would like to, to stop. I've given you just a brief overview from the ideas. Um, and in this ideas, there's lots of things for economists to do because many of these questions need the marginal thinking of economists and the cost benefit analysis of how we need to tackle and think about these type of, uh, of, of, of issues, which is not being done so far. So on that point, let me stop. Thank you very much. Great, Vin. Uh, very interesting indeed. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I think Klaus was raising his hand. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I think uh, Wim, this is a fantastic was a fantastic presentation. Um, I, I I have no 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 much knowledge not much knowledge about uh, AI. I'm just uh, I'm just uh, excited to see what kind of research we have. Also, the outlook is not necessarily exciting all the time. Now, what you're saying uh, looks looks uh, potentially dramatic, and we have to be aware of this potential. Of course, it it it, it objects to many other people who maybe not taking enough care about AI. For instance, Odin Dalla, a, a friend of the, a big friend of this organization has published this year, this book on uh, humanity. And his claim is that it will, uh, will humanity will move up. And uh, this is in particular because we educate uh, us much better. We, we, we have gender and uh, whatever equality in the future and, and so on. Um, uh, that um, the question is why he can be so completely wrong. Now, what, what, what my feeling, my feeling is, uh, what is gross? Um, um, in, in the, that was my initial understanding. Maybe that's a bit of a naive question. Um, what is gross? Um, 
in, in, in a society dominated by AI. Yes? Um, uh, is there still a market? Um, maybe, well, no, maybe not, yes, maybe, uh, I don't know. And it, are there are prices and, and so on. Um, so so what is what is growth and what what is real growth? Um, sometimes it's about these innovations, we know that sometimes it's very difficult to to measure that. Um, but in particular, when, when, when it's exploding in such a way, um, um, well, uh, we need to understand. Um, okay, we don't need people with humans, so the the, 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 the earth is, is not over, uh, is, is cannot be overpopulated, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> it's not a space problem anymore, I mean, uh, and so on. So, yeah, I understand all this, yes. Uh, okay, what is goal? That's my question, really. Yes, this is um, this is indeed the question of you know can growth be decoupled from how we understand economic growth. So in a digital sense, you know, if you create, uh, think about the the the, the wealth created by selling um, NFT tokens online, it it adds hugely to the GDP, but it has no physical uh, implications or little physical implications, right? So the growth becomes qualitatively much different than before. The problem, however, is that ultimately the growth would need energy. There's, there's no way in, in, in our modern understanding of modern physics that we can continue, you know, the AI would use large amounts of energy and it would probably be able to build Dyson spheres around the, the sun to be able to generate um, and, and honest all the energy of the sun. But eventually the waste heat from all that energy growth will be so much that maximum we can do that for 400 years, then the earth would literally boil over. So physicists have written as a recent paper actually in Nature magazine on the limits of economic growth, which addresses precisely your question in a way, what is growth? And it ultimately comes to the question that even if we have growth in energy demand as the moment, energy use has grown by 2% per year per average, we cannot continue that more than 80 or 90 years into the future. Uh, this is physically impossible. We run into these physical constraints, right? even if we decouple growth from capital and labor input. So, yeah, indeed, you are quite right. But I think as economists as well, and this is also the point that I make in the paper, economists think growth is infinite because they don't think about what is really growth. And when you talk to physicists, they tell you, no, economists are crazy. They think that, you know, growth can just continue continually. They don't think about, you know, the second law of thermodynamics at all. And so I argue we need to start thinking as economists about these fundamental physical limits. It will make our endogenous growth theories better because, you know, endogenous growth theory has no thing about energy in it. It's capital, labor, and ideas. You know, and I think that Romer was correct with ideas, but he completely left energy out of the picture. And energy has been a thing that's been driving economic growth for the last 200 years. And now we see with the energy crisis in Europe and the world how important energy will be. And now if we want to make an energy transition before we have alternative sources of energy, our whole growth and development will come tumbling down. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Wim. Uh, would love to discuss more, but in sake of time, I think we should move uh, to the next paper. Thanks a lot, um, Wim. Uh, the next paper uh, will be from Angelica. Uh, she's from the University Moderna Reggio Emilia, GLO. Pop and IZA, and the title is Is Self Employment for Migrants Evidence from Italy? Angelica, please. Yes, good morning again, and thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to participate, and thank you for having co organized this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, let me try to now, please let me know if you can see the presentation. Yes, we can. Can you see? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, this is a joint work with um, uh, Mariana Brunetti, who is from the University of Rome, uh, Tor Vigata. And uh, it is actually very much work in progress. And so I would be, of course, very grateful for your comments or suggestions uh, on, uh, on, this, uh, on this. Now, the, uh, the paper is about self-employment, uh, self-employment, a gap in self-employment uh, between immigrant and natives, and we uh, uh, use the data for, uh, from Italy. Now, immigration, of course, as we all know, is very important currently, uh, and um, there are uh, many studies on labor market out outcomes of immigrants, there are fewer studies on immigrant native gaps in entrepreneurship. And self-employment is uh, even uh, immigrant self-employed make a significant contribution to the host country's economy. Uh, they do create jobs, they bring know-how and innovation, transfer knowledge, uh, and so foster economic and social networks between the countries of and the destination. Now, 
often migrants are viewed as being more entrepreneurial and willing to take risks. Uh, indeed, on the one hand, immigrants may be pulled into self-employment by prospects of earning higher income there or um, by some other favorable attributes such as more flexibility or possibilities of self-realization and so on. On the other hand, however, individuals may be pushed into self-employment uh, due to the disadvantaged position in the labor market, inability to access the salary jobs uh, a sector and also language barriers or inappropriate qualification. Now, immigrants and natives are likely indeed to be different uh, with respect to their self-employment decisions due to many different uh, uh, factors. The differences in labor market prospects, uh, differences in savings and wealth accumulation, uh, differences in access to credit. Um, there is, of course, selection, selection into migration, selection into self-employment, uh, and also differences in unobservable characteristics, such as risk preferences in particular. Entrepreneurship is a risky uh, decision, a risky behavior. And finally, there are also cultural differences that may matter. Now, there is a literature, of course, also on the determinants on the decision of self-employment. And in general, studies, existing studies document a higher business ownership rate among the foreign-born uh, than the native-born uh, in many developed countries. Although there is a paper actually by uh, Amelie Constant and Klaus Zimmermann for Germany, who found similar actually among immigrants and natives. Now, uh, the determinants of entrepreneurship, uh, this studies uh, point to uh, the following age, education, language proficiency, wealth holding is important, family structure, gender, sort of employment. Uh, also, previous self employment in the whole country was actually found uh, to matter. Uh, migrant networks are important. And uh, uh, there is a study that also shows that intermarriage patterns are, uh, are important and may act actually mm, through the uh, enhancing this network for, for migrants. Uh, now, there is uh, um, the studies also um, actually uh, point at discrimination as one of the determinants, again, the paper by Amelie um, Constant Klaus Zimmermann. Uh, with respect to risk attitudes, uh, there is actually one paper only that looks at the um, uh, risk uh, that incorporates uh, uh, risk attitudes, uh, and, but it looks only at the self-employment decision in general. So it does not really distinguish between immigrants and native. It does not analyze the immigrant-native gap in self-employment. This is a paper by Marco Caliendo, who uh, uh, incorporates uh, risk attitudes as a determinant of self-employment uh, self in general. Uh, and then, uh, uh, again, personal wealth, access to financial capital and liquidity constraints uh, were basically um, all found to be important for the uh, self-employment decision. Now, studies also found that the, uh, there is a heterogeneity uh, by uh, country of origin, so cultural factors matter. Some uh, uh, ethnic groups engage more in self-employment than the others. Um, uh, and also uh, uh, assimilation and cohort effects were found for self-employment. Now, there is a recent paper that actually also shows that motives of migration are important, uh, as a study and economic migrants are less likely to engage in self-employment compared to family and asylum migrants. Uh, uh, and the overall, in general, with the exception of that paper, as I said, uh, uh, by Marco Caliendo, unobserved heterogeneity, and in particular, risk, risk preferences are not taken into account. Now, in this paper, we actually do account for risk preferences. Uh, 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 we studies the gap, immigrant native gap, including accounting or controlling for the risk uh, uh, aversion. Mm -hmm. And we investigate uh, the gap using the data for Italy. It's a rich data set over 2004, 2020. Um, and we also look at the heterogeneity, we investigate the heterogeneity by gender, country of origin. We do have information on migration motives. Uh, and we also are able to actually um, investigate the intermarriage, uh, intermarriage patterns. Uh, now, this is a part which is, as I mentioned, still work in progress. We look at the potential channels behind the gap. Uh, and so uh, I would like to share with you the results that we found so far. But again, if you have any comments or suggestions, I would be very grateful. Now, in general, the main results are as follows. We do find the negative gap, actually, in immigrant, uh, 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 negative immigrant native gap in self-employment in contrast to most of the studies in the literature. The gap is negative and quite robust. Now, the gap is the largest for men 
the economic migrants and those who come from sub-Saharan Africa. We also find evidence for assimilation, the self-employment probability increases with years since migration, uh, and we do find that also intermarriage and networks matter, as the gap is actually small or not significant for mixed couples. It mainly comes from uh, uh, couples in which both are migrants. A little bit about the context. So Italy actually has experienced one of the fastest increase in immigration. In the past uh, 15 years, it actually had almost a threefold increase in the stock of foreign born legally residing in the country. Uh, it has faced significant immigrant flows following uh, US enlargements and also uh, a large refugees in close recently. Uh, currently, the share of foreign born is actually more than 10%, uh, 10.4% in 2021, and 54% of migrants are women. This is just a couple of graphs to illustrate what I have just said. So, as you see, there is uh, uh, the spikes around the EU is enlargement indeed in 2004 and 2007, and there is some break in the series, but you can see that there is an increase in the stock, in the share of foreign born population uh, indeed. Uh, the main changing countries are Romania, Albania, and Morocco. And uh, as you know, in Italy, there is a sharp north-south divide. So most of migrants reside actually in the north or in the center. So the largest share of immigrants are settled in Lombardy, Latium, and Emilia-Romagna. The unemployment rate is higher for foreign-born. Uh, they also tend to be more frequently employed or overqualified, actually, for the jobs in which they are more employed and also receive lower wages. Now, the data that we use, we use the data from the Bank of Italy. It's a, it's a historical archive uh, of the survey of household income and wealth, the so-called SHIP data set, which is a representative survey of households legally residing in Italy. It's a rotating panel, and we use eight waves. Uh, of it uh, from 2004 to 2020. The basic sample unit is actually the household, but the, uh, there is a detailed information available for each member of the household. So we use the individual data set in the end. We keep uh, working uh, uh, individuals in, uh, between 18 and 65 years old and immigrant equals one, even uh, persons of foreign born. Now, the self-employment definition is as follows. The self-employment category includes the following. Uh, freelancer, individual entrepreneur, self-employed, owner or member of a family business, and is also the so-called active shareholder or a partner. So in the robustness check, we use actually the more restrictive definition. We focus only on the three categories, which is individual entrepreneur, self-employed, or owner, or member of the family. We start in the methodology, we mainly employ the standard probit uh, regressions, uh, and the basic covariates uh, include the gender, age, marital status, education, household size, wealth, uh, and also year and macro region fixed effects. Now, uh, as I said, we do. We are able to control for risk, risk preferences of an individual, and the question actually in this survey asks about the preferred financial investment. So whether an individual prefer uh, an investment, an option with uh, high returns but also high risk, uh, or uh, you know, there is it's actually an index. It goes from one to four. So uh, four would be no risk uh, uh, and low returns, uh, and one would be high risk and high return. So we uh, uh, generate a variable which we call risk aversion, which equals one if the individual chooses option four. So if he would prefer or she would prefer no risk and low returns. Uh, we do control for years since migration, as I have said, and also the sector of employment. Now, of course, uh, the unobserved heterogeneity is important. Uh, the migrant are selected group, uh, the reselection into self-employment. Um, so we try to address this issue by, uh, well, first of all, including the rich set of observable characteristics, controlling for risk aversion, which is the crucial determinant of self-employment. Uh, and also, uh, we use a propensity score matching as one of our robustness checks. This is just some descriptive statistics. So basically already here, you can see that the share of self-employed is lower among immigrants than among natives. And just very quickly, some uh, uh, characteristics uh, compared to natives, immigrants are younger, there is lower proportion of males, lower proportion of singles, uh, smaller family size, uh, they are less educated, there is low proportion with high education. Now, one of the interesting things is that we found that actually compared to migrants, immigrants are more risk averse. So this may sound contrary to the 
uh, let's say, expectations, because as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, immigrants are often seen as being more uh, risk-loving, but actually this is consistent also with uh, uh, another paper by Klaus Zimmermann, <laughs> Amelie Constant and co in which they found for Germany also that uh, the uh, immigrants compared to natives are, are also more risk averse. Uh, so immigrants are also less wealthy and uh, uh, there is an unequal distribution across the sectors. So they are overrepresented in construction, domestic services, uh, and underrepresented in uh, financial and other professional services. Main reason for migration. Oh my God! Main reason for migration are job related. This paper shows <laughs> the sorry. This paper shows the main result. As I said, the unadjusted gap is around ten percentage points. It's a marginal effect uh, with robust standard errors weighted by population weights. And the when we control for all the available characteristics, the gap is around eleven percentage points. Heterogeneity by gender. So, as you see, the gap is almost double for male the, uh, in the last column, uh, for females, around eight percentage points, for men, around 17. And this is a table that shows that intermarriage mat uh, matters. So, we do find evidence that indeed uh, in the couples in which both in, uh, immigrants, the gap is uh, significant and quite large, while in the mixed couple, in the couples in which one is immigrant and one is native, the gap is either not significant or quite small around three percentage points also. There is a heterogeneity by country of origin. The largest gap is the sub-Saharan Africa. The smallest is the one, uh, those who come from Asia. And, uh, uh, migration motives, as I said, job-related are actually, uh, those who come for job-related reasons experience the largest immigration gap. Now, we try to experiment to look at the potential channels behind this gap. Uh, and we first include the set of variables that aim to capture the easiness of doing business. Uh, for, especially for immigrants, for example, the share and absolute number of firms run by immigrants in the region of residence, uh, the, the services for immigrants as measured by per capita expenditures devoted to migrants uh, in the region of residence, networks proxied by the share of immigrants coming from the same uh, geographic region in the year and the region of residence. So as you see, basically, the main conclusion is that networks matter, as, as share of migrants, for example, is not significant, but share of migrants from the same area of origin is indeed positive and significant. However, these, uh, 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 let's say, factors do not seem to reduce the gap. We then turn to other uh, potential channels. We look at the indebtedness or access to credit liquidity constraints. Uh, we have different uh, information on the availability of um, access to, uh, well, uh, whether an individual got a partial access to credit, the full access to credit, whether he is credit constrained, uh, and uh, whether he did not even apply for the loan or is discouraged. And finally, we have also information on informal debt. Uh, they, uh, we were hoping actually that this would be uh, a significant determinant, the, uh, the debt with parents, relatives, or friends. Just very briefly, not showing you all the results, uh, Credit constraint in deep matter, but all these determinants also does not seem to reduce the gap. Very quickly on matching, we do the propensity score matching estimation. Uh, we mentioned the estimated propensity score. Uh, as you see, these statistics after matching almost all the covariates, with the exception of uh, gender, but uh, the difference is quite small, are indeed uh, uh, insignificant. Non support assumption is satisfied, the standard and bias is around zero. The distribution of propensity score, uh, again, uh, the common support uh, assumption is satisfied. So the matching estimates are smaller. It's around actually two percentage points, but they're still negative and quite significant. We did other robustness checks. Uh, we also employed the linear probability model, excluded agriculture, and we focused on the small restrictive definition, and we do find still the negative. Uh, between immigrants and natives. So just very briefly to wrap up, uh, the, uh, we do find that the, uh, there is exist a gap, but contrary to the most of the literature, we do find actually that there is a negative gap uh, in self-employment in Italy. Uh, we find evidence with assim for assimilation, so uh, the probability of self-employment uh, for immigrants increases with the years in Italy, and the potential explanations uh, that we uh, uh, can offer so far basically relates to the specificity of the Italian labor market, because entrepreneurship is also widespread among natives, there is high demand for unskilled immigrant labor and also large informal sectors. 
So it seems that quickly entering uh, in other country, uh, uh, immigrants were used uh, were, uh, use, uh, using self-employment in order to quickly enter into self-employment when they had difficulties um, to enter the salaried employment sector. Uh, in Italy, it does not seem actually to be the case because uh, it holds only for those who has resided in Italy for long. Uh, and there is also the good uh, social status of self-employment and its popularity among natives. So while immigrants actually fill in most, let's say, difficult jobs. Uh, the potential channels, uh, um, networks uh, through intermarriage actually seem to work, uh, the, to be the, uh, the, the valid channel for immigrants uh, to reduce, let's say, their disadvantage in self-employment. So the, the, by marrying to a native, they have, uh, they have access to financial credit may be access to information to better job opportunities. Uh, the other channels that we have looked so far, uh, access to credit and being credit constrained per se matter for self-employment decision, but it does not seem to reduce the gap between immigrants and natives. And also access to informal debt does not seem to, to, to reduce the gap. So we conclude so far that um, access liquidity constraints, access to formal and informal credit may actually be important for natives as well. So sorry if I have taken too much time. Hopefully we are still on time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Angelica. Uh, we have time for a quick question or comments. Uh, I see Klaus. Yes. Very quickly, I don't want to dominate uh, the discussion here, but uh, that's indeed very, very, very surprising. So to speak, it, it uh, rules out, I mean, the, the, the traditional image of a migrant coming in to be self-employed. Uh, self um, uh, that's, uh, now, is this, uh, how much uh, can you say this is uh, more global evidence we have ignored uh, that so far, or is this particular for Italy? And uh, the other question has to do: uh, What's about informality of work? Do you do you uh, take account of that issue? Exactly. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, globally, actually, uh, the my reading of the literature indeed is that, as you said, it's um, with what we also expected to find the positive gap. The migrants are viewed as more entrepreneurial, and more self-employed. So um, our interpretation so far is, apart for the paper, your paper, actually, for Germans, that you also found that there is a similar, uh, a similar uh, propensity to engage in self-employment between immigrants and natives. Uh, the other studies, basically, uh, most of the studies find the positive. Gap. So our interpretation is indeed the specificity of the Italian labor market, because self-employment is also actually quite common among natives. It's widespread also among natives. It has a good image. It, it looks, uh, so it looks like also natives are, uh, so for immigrants do face the barriers actually to entering also into self-employment in Italy. So this, uh, we, again, we do not push so much, too much, uh, too far this hypothesis so far, because we still want to, 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 let's say, also to get more information or to dig more into the potential channels behind uh, this gap. But so far, this is what we find, indeed. It does relate to the specificity of the Italian labor market, the fact that the, the uh, self-employment is also widespread among the natives. It has uh, a good social status. And also that, um, indeed, there is an, a large informal sector. Uh, 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 it, might be, it might be also that, uh, for, we do not capture basically what we do not capture the uh, the, the informality with, uh, with with the measures that we are using here. It might be as well uh, related to this. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Thank I you think very we much. We need to move on. Yes. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you. Great. Um, so then we can move to Enrico. Um, thank you for joining and welcome. Uh, Enrico is from the University of Padova, the Research Institute for the Evaluation of Public Policies, uh, IZA, Poppet Numerit, and the GLO. And the title of his presentation is uh, Making Subsidies Work, Roots versus Discretion. Enrico, the floor is yours. If you're talking, we cannot hear you yet. You may still be on mute. Yeah, of course. Yes, now we can hear you, thank you. Yeah, so there are uh, three other 
people working on this. Uh, sorry, just a moment. Okay, this way. Okay, fine. Uh, Federico from the Bank of Italy, Filippo in Princeton, uh, is a doctoral student, and Paolo Bocconi University. So this is about uh, um, subsidies to firms, uh, which we know are a major tool of industrial policy in several countries. It takes a uh, uh, big uh, share of the public budget, both in the US and the European Union. It is also crucial for the economic recovery after the pandemic. Um, so the aim, generally speaking, is to create employment in disadvantaged areas. And of course, the effectiveness of this kind of intervention depends on the ability to target good project, good firms. So the allocation mechanism, the selection rule, is crucial to the eff effectiveness of this uh, type of intervention. So when evaluating the policy effects, we know, we all know, there are uh, the main challenges are, first of all, the internal validity. So we, we should be able to uh, obtain uh, an association, a correlation between the exposure to the intervention and the outcome, deserving a causal interpretation. And of course, we need to care about the heterogeneity. How does the effect vary between different types of firms? And finally, external validity. Are we able to generalize the results to different contexts or maybe to uh, different uh, reshaped ways of uh, assigning the subsidy, different rules? Uh, so there, we know there is a typically a trade-off in particular between target one and target three. So by now we we have an array of credible tools to identify a causal effect. But then the question is whether we are able to generalize the results we get on a specific uh, uh, case study. Uh, the extreme case is the case of the regression discontinuity design, which is about what I'm talking about today. Because we know that the RDD is able to provide a credible a causal effect, average causal effect, but on a very specific subpopulation of units, those close to the cutoff relevant for the assignment of the intervention. So this is an extreme case of a trade-off between internal and external validity. So today I'm talking about uh, a major program of public subsidies in Italy, it is Law 488. Uh, there is rationing of funds in this case. So application, applicants are ranked on a quantitative score, one, one single uh, running variable, generating an ideal setup for a regression discontinuity design. And this score, this running variable, uh, sum is the sum of objective criteria and one component of discretionary priority by local politicians. So we are comparing, we are trying to compare the um, impact of using uh, the objective criteria versus the discretionary uh, priority by local politicians. So in the first step, we estimate the effect on marginal firms. So firms are the cutoff exploiting the RDD setup. And then we exploit a recent idea by Angrist and Rokkanen to identify the causal effect away from the cutoff. So generalizing the result of the cutoff. Um, so the institutional background, so law 488 introduced in 1992 is the main instrument of the industrial policy in Italy. The primary aim, of course, is to increase employment in disadvantaged areas of the of the of Italy. Uh, the policy tool is the investment subsidies to firms, a uh, large uh, budget for this intervention, 26 uh, billions over 35 different calls over the year from 1996 to 2007, so more than 10 years. So the allocation mechanism, so each call, each of those 35 calls are targeting specific sector, industry, services, and so on. And the funds within uh, each call are preliminarily allocated across regions. As you can imagine, being the target disadvantaged areas, most of the funds went to the southern part of Italy, even if not only to southern part of Italy. Um, 
the applications, the applicants are ranked within each sector region cell according to a quantitative score. This is the running variable of the RDD. And this quantitative score is the sum of uh, uh, different scores clearly defined ex ante. Over the first two years, there were only objective criteria. Skin in the game, this is the own funds, the applicant is ready to put into the project, the number of jobs they plan to create. And the third criterion was funds requested by the applicant relative to the maximum they can apply for. This is only during the first two years. Starting from 1998, a fourth component to the score was added, the political discretion. This is an index decided discretionally by the regional government. Forget the fifth one, which is really a marginal one. So in the end, the running variable of the RDD, the score relevant for the application is the sum of the five normalized score. This is the running variable of the RDD. Um, so we have information on uh, uh, approximately 75,000 projects. <clears throat> and we are using administrative data on employment on and on balance sheets. And uh, the empirical, the outcome we look at are investment, the impact of the subsidy on investment, on employment, on the productivity, and on the survival of firms. And to begin with, uh, what we do is uh, run an RDD, pulling together all the 35 codes. Okay, so we end up with one single uh, regression discontinuity design, and we compare the outcome, the average outcome for those immediately to the right of the cutoff to the outcome for those immediately below to the cutoff. It's a very plain standard RDD. Here are some test to validate the RDD. I'm skipping here to the time constraint. And uh, here is the first uh, main result. So zero is the normalized cutoff. You see that to the left of zero, no one is receiving even a single euro of subsidy, while to the right, there is a, a approximately on average, immediately to the right, half a million euros of subsidy. And here you have the to the left, to the right, sorry, is the log of the accumulated firm investment over three years. So this is the amount of the subsidy, average subsidy at the cutoff, and uh, bearing a 39% increase in firm investment over the first three years after the receipt of the subsidy, so which is pretty, pretty large. Uh, here is the impact on employment one year after the receipt of the subsidy, three years, uh, three years after, and six years after. So 33% the first year, 10% after three years, 17% after uh, six years. Uh, so dynamic effects over an horizon of six years on investment, employment, revenues, value added, value added per worker and survival probability. You see there is uh, everywhere, but here, a uh, large impact and uh, lasting over the years. But you see here, there is no impact at all on the productivity of firms, the value added per worker. So bottom line out of the plain RDT, an impact as large as 39% on investment, 10% uh, uh, after three years on employment, 17% after six years, no impact on firm productivity, a large increase in firm survival at the cutoff. The point of course is what is happening away from the cutoff for the other firms. And it is here that we exploit the paper by Angrist and Rokan. And this is Journal of the American Statistical Association 2015. Their idea is very, very simple. So in the RDD, we know that we perfectly know the selection rule. It depends only on the uh, running variable, the score based on the feature of the, of the applicant. So if the score is positively correlated to the outcome, then we have a problem of the selection bias. So their idea is to check whether 
which might or might not be the case, of course, check whether the, there is any set of pre-intervention observable characteristics, let's call them X, conditional on which the outcome is unrelated to the uh, score, the running variable of the, of the RTD. So here is the point. So uh, here we have the score on the horizontal axis and the outcome on the vertical axis. Zero is the normalized cutoff. So it is clear that there is a correlation between the score and the outcome. And it is due to this correlation that we run into a selection bias problem. We are unable to compare overall participants to non-participants. But after conditioning on the set of observables we have available, that correlation between the score and the outcome disappears. So there's no, long, no longer any correlation between the score and the, the, and, the, and the outcome. The observables we are conditioning on are the size of firm, their age, and other predictors of firm growth. So as a matter of fact, it seems that conditioning on X, we are able to get rid of the selection bias problem. And by the, in addition to that, uh, here is the propensity score based on those set of variable observables for, the, for those receiving the subsidy and those not receiving the, the subsidy. And it is clear that there is a large overlap between the support for the two groups. So what we do in the end is very simple. We match subsidized to unsubsidized firms on those observable characteristics to get an overall average treatment effect of the subsidy, not only at the cutoff. And here is the uh, results uh, in, in, in short, the results we got. This is with reference to the cost per new job, uh, using different ways of selecting the observables, but results are basically the same. So overall, the cost per new job in thousands is as large as 170, 180, with a large difference between the south of Italy and the north center of Italy. So the cost per new job is much, much higher in the south of Italy as compared to the rest of the country. Same story for cost per worker year. So overall, uh, all over Italy, it is uh, in the range 50 to 60 thousands euro per worker per year, again, with a large difference between the south and the north center of Italy. And finally, here is the ratio of, uh, wait a moment, the ratio of uh, subsidy to investment. It is one euro per one euro in the south, while in the north center, it is uh, the subsidy is approximately one third of the overall investment. So again, a large difference between the two parts of Italy, which I mean, is a story we all know since ever, I would say. Yes. One um, minute, Enrico. One minute, okay. I'm going to two. the two minutes. Let me go to the final point, rules versus discretion. So we, here we are able to compare the role played by the objective rule to the role played by the, the politician discretion. So first of all, there is a clear negative correlation between the two scores. So the larger the index for political discretion, the lower the index on objective rules. And the main point here is the this heat map here. So the cost effectiveness, so the number of new jobs created per euro increases with uh, uh, the objective rule. So the larger the objective rule, the lower the cost per new job created, mm -hmm. while the cost per new job created increases with the political discretion. Uh, and the explanation is very simple. The local politicians target applicant firms that are smaller and demand larger subsidies as compared to the objective. This is the reason why there is that large difference between objective and uh, discretionary rules. Here in the final slide, what we do is to compare 
the actual outcome, which is the cost per new job created, to counterfactual allocation rules. So first of all, we derive the cost per new job created if uh, we if there were no discretion in the allocation. So this is an allocation rule based only on the objective criteria. And you see that the cost per new job created would decrease by approximately 10%. The other counterfactual policy is the one based only on discretion. So no room here for the objective criteria. And what you see that is that the cost per new job created would increase by on average 50%. So this is the, the difference between rules and discretion. So the conclusion is that uh, uh, this uh, policy to the law for 88, it had a positive effect on investment, large, positive effect on employment, at the cutoff. There is large heterogeneity in the effect of subsidies across different types of firms. Large firms are more cost effective than small firms. And finally, it is also clear that uh, an allocation uh, rule based only on objective indices are much better than those based on the discretion of the local politicians. I will stop here. Great, thanks so much, Enrico. And the floor is open for some discussion. Klaus. I, I have a question, but of course I do not want to dominate the, <laughs> take away all the comments. Uh, I mean, very short for, for my side now. Um, that uh, that obviously firm survival is 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 better, so to speak. Uh, I heard or remember, but productivity is not rising, and and so on. Now, yeah. Sub subsidies subsidies in general are. I mean, subsidies in general are uh, something uh, policy policymakers do because they want to help short term or they have long term interest. Uh, so isn't this? Uh, quite yeah. What 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 you should see? Um, and uh, now the question is, uh, well, is this good in terms of uh, uh, long term market policies? That's difficult difficult to judge. But I think uh, all your results are look very nice and, and fine. Um, in particular, also that rules are better than than discretion. That's uh, what we uh, what we want to see. Yes. Um, the question is still it might be uh, that there might be good reasons or not no good reasons for give subsidies. But in principle, I would say say this is, looks all nice and convincing. OK, so long term, of course, we don't know. We Our results uh, are mm -hmm. up to six years after the received. By the way, we also have results up to 10 years, and they are basically the same, but we are not in the position to say anything on the uh, outcomes impact after 10 years since the receipt of the, of the subsidy. Uh, rules versus discretion, there might be other reasons. Yes, of course, there might be other reasons. I mean, we cannot, in principle, we cannot exclude that there is something else, some other outcomes we are not considering here, with respect to which uh, discretionality might have uh, might have a uh, uh, good reason to be there. Uh, we, we we really don't know, of course. We well, re well, re-election of local policymakers would be one. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, but okay, I know. Yeah, I've studied stuff for other countries. Uh, where um, this is a kind of concern, yes, corruption or, or, or I mean, political, not necessarily corruption in the narrow sense, yes. But, but if if a policymaker invites, uh, it gives 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 uh, subsidies to be reelected, uh, that might be in the interest of uh, of of his of the voters, and that's good. And but it might be or just be it's difficult to judge, but it might be just be to. Uh, to, to support re-election, that it would be something like corruption yes, in a different way. Yeah, yeah. Trying to buy the consensus of the of their constitu of their um, constituency. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Klaus. Any other thoughts, comments, questions?
before we move forward. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so we um, can stick more or less still to the time. Thanks a lot, Enrico. Really interesting. And then we'll move to the next paper uh, from uh, Ben uh, from the uh, Institute for Employment Research uh, in Nuremberg and the University at Lang Nuremberg on gender specific application behavior matching and the residual gender earnings gap. Please, Ben, the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ben. Uh, I hope you can hear me uh, well. I'm gonna, yes. present I'm gonna present joint work with Christian and we're, we're from Nuremberg in Germany, uh, both from the university and the Institute for Employment Research. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about, well, differences in the application behaviors of women and men uh, differences in their selection behavior of firms and what that has to do with the uh, earnings gap in Germany. Um, uh, I think you would all agree that we saw some advances of, for women in the labor market uh, during the last decades, but still there is a substantial wage gap. And this seems to be true for many, many countries. Uh, surprisingly, however, there is not much knowledge in the literature about the role of a large part of the labor market, and that is labor market search uh, to, this, to these gaps. Uh, only recently people uh, have written papers about that. Uh, I listed here a couple of them, uh, and I don't have the time to go into the details uh, of these papers, but let me emphasize the main difference between them and our paper. Uh, these papers look at the question, uh, through the eyes of a worker. So they have a worker perspective, uh, mainly because they are using worker surveys to, to look into that. Uh, whereas we are able to look uh, at this topic from the firm perspective, because we have uh, we are using the IRB shop vacancy survey, which is an establishment survey uh, that gives us many details about the recruitment processes of German establishments. And the advantage that we have is that we can link that Kind of to the worker side because we can link the actual hires that uh, establishments report about in the survey to the administrative employment records that we have at the IRB. So we know a lot of a lot of things about the hiring process and we also see the outcomes uh, in the admin data um, and that is that is good to have. And we use this data to really open up the, the black box of, of, of men's and women's application behavior and how that interacts with the earnings gap. And to this end, we're gonna provide a very simple two-stage search model. And from this model, we derive uh, two distinctive uh, predictions. The first one is taste-based discrimination. And the second one is uh, uh, goes back to Claudia Golden's idea of linear and non-linear production functions for certain kind of jobs. Um, here, are, uh, like the key findings, are, uh, uh, a preview of them. Uh, what we find is we find a substantial dif we find, find substantial differences in the application behavior of uh, men and, and women, especially at low and high wage firms. Uh, at high wage firms, we see that men are up to twenty percentage points more likely to apply at these high wage firms compared to women. Uh, at the same time, we find no significant differences in the employer's uh, gender-specific hiring behavior. That means that once a firm uh, gets an a comparable application from a man and a woman in our data set, there's no discrimination at this hiring, mar hiring margin. Of course, conditioning on, on a lot of observables. What we also find, uh, and this, uh, is that women are less likely to apply for jobs with certain attributes. So uh, from the survey, we know uh, um, whether jobs are associated with a certain degree of flexibility requirements. So for example, we know uh, for, for a particular job, the need for business travels or the need for working overtime or the need for, um, well, very short notice changes in the working schedule. And uh, we see that women seem to avoid these, these jobs uh, with these high flexibility requirements. 
And but but these are typically the jobs that are paid uh, better. Um, is it quantitatively important? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, if we take that the application behavior into account in in uh, in simple wage regressions, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, these can explain up to sixty percent of the residual earnings gap in Germany. Uh, we also look at mothers compared to non-mothers and and men, and we find that. Uh, in line with Claudia Goldin's um, um, idea of nonlinear production functions, uh, that if mothers uh, match in jobs that require much flexibility, they have the largest wage discounts. Um, okay, let me walk you uh, through the model real quick. I don't show you any equations. I will be very intuitive. So we assume that there are different uh, job profiles. They have a different output level. And for a match to happen, we have two stages. The first one is the application stage of workers. And the second one is then uh, the stage where worker and firms meet and then uh, the firm decides uh, whether uh, to form a match or not. Okay. And it, the condition on the first stage is uh, the following. Well, a worker will only apply if and only if uh, the expected match returns are larger than uh, some application costs. And we can assume that these applications costs are ex ante and we draw them from some stable density. On the second stage, uh, as I already told you, uh, th this is the stage where worker, worker firm pair meet. And uh, we're going to assume another shock. And that is, that is an ex post match specific IED shock. Uh, you can think of it as a draining cost shock or something. So the firms and worker meet, and then there's a a match specific shock, uh, like the firm has has to cover some draining costs, which are specific to the match. And then the match will only occur uh, if there's a bilateral joint surplus from, from doing so. Uh, the first scenario, the first prediction that we're going to derive from the model is about taste-based discrimination. And we simply do that by introducing uh, a negative term uh, in the in the uh, hiring, in, in the selection condition of, of firms. So we can assume that there's, there are some firms that disfavor females. And, and what, what, how we model it is there, uh, here you can see that the threshold uh, draining costs that a firm is willing to accept. And this, this discrimination part basically uh, brings down the, 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 the threshold cost, meaning that they are only uh, willing to accept lower draining costs when it comes to hiring females. And uh, this will transfer to uh, lower female selection rates of firms. And since females will anticipate that on the first stage, they will apply less at, at these kind, kinds of employers. Um, the second scenario that, that we try to test is about this Claudia Golden's idea about linear and nonlinear production functions. Uh, here we introduce, uh, well, some measure of worker input uh, and, and uh, match output. And, and output is connected to wages as well. So here you can see there are certain jobs where, where the production function is linear. Uh, and there are certain jobs where, where there's a kind of a piecewise linear production function, meaning that once you exceed like a threshold, uh, there's an there's a extra in, in output or in extra in wages. Uh, I give you an intuitive example. So think of a, a, of a surgeon uh, in a hospital and there can be a surgeon in a hospital that, that is available on, on call on very short, short notice. And there can be a, a surgeon that is, that is working on, on very reliable working hours in a doctor's office. So the same job but the one is, is willing to provide more flexibility. So flexibility is our input measure, so to say. And uh, that, that is paying a higher wage for, the, for, the, for providing flexibility. There's a compensating differential, if you want to call it like that. Uh, and for the sake of the argument, if you're willing to assume that on average, more men are willing to provide the flexibility uh, than, than women, our model will generate a strong sorting pattern. Okay, why? Well. Because uh, it's obvious, uh, low, there, there will be lower female application rates at these nonlinear jobs as compared to, to men. Uh, 
but there will, will be sim similar gender specific sele selection rates by firms because there's no, in the model, there's no mechanism uh, for this discrimination or anything else. Okay. Uh, and now we're taking these two scenarios to the data and we use the IAB job vacancy survey that we link to the, what is called the integrated employment biographies. Uh, and the beauty is that we have detailed information about the, the exact number of male and female applicants for each job. Uh, and, and we also know these flexibility requirements for each job. Okay? And the advantage as well is that we can link it to, um, um, well, firm wage premiums that we have estimated from very large wage regressions. Um, Okay, and here is uh, one of the key results. So on the left-hand side, uh, you see in blue, the share of male applicants over a grid of different D size of uh, wage, uh, firm wage premiums, okay? So one is the lowest wage and 10 is the highest wage premium. And what you can see is, uh, is, is very striking. So the share of male applicants is kind of monotonically increasing in the, in the firm wage premium. And the flip side is that, that it's decreasing from, uh, for females. Uh, on the right-hand side, we, we basically zoom in. So we control for, for sectors, for firm sizes, and for very detailed occupational codes. So this is basically uh, to control for a certain kind of job, okay? And it's striking. Uh, I mean, the difference is still there. So it's, it, it, it gets uh, smaller, but there's still a, a eight percentage points difference at the very high wage firms and a 10 percentage point difference in the very low wage firms, okay? So uh, this basically uh, speaks in, in, in favor that, that there are th large differences in the application rates, okay? This one speaks against like the discrimination uh, prediction that we derive, um, because here I do the same exercise, but I'm showing you the select, the gender specific selection rate of firms, okay? So once they receive the application, what is the probability of being selected? And you can see on the left-hand side, again, unconditionally, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of overlapping in all of these details, okay? So there's no, there's no statistical differences in the selection rates. And uh, when, we con when we zoom into these specific jobs, uh, it, it gets even clearer. They, I mean, it's basically the same. There's no difference. Um, okay. The next thing I want to show you is these flexibility requirements. And I want to, I'm interested in the, the correlation between these flexibility requirements and the share of male applicants. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm showing you four different uh, measures. Uh, here, the first one is simply hours. So it seems to be the case that there are more male applicants in shops with higher hours. So this, is, I mean, this is, seems to be clear. Here, I'm, I'm plotting. The, the need for uh, changing working hours on very short notice. Um, and it's, there are more males uh, in shops where, where there's a frequent need for these changes, okay? The, the more frequently these changes are, the more males are, are in these, uh, are applying in these shops. Here, it's the same for mobility. So mobility means like the need for business trips or the need to be physically, uh, at, at different places, okay? And it's here, it, it is striking. So the share of male applicants in this very high mobility jobs is, is almost 70%. Uh, again, controlled for very detailed occupational codes and, and things like that. And the same is true for working overtime. Uh, now we want to see if that, that, that patterns are quantitatively important for the, for the earnings gap. So, we, we do a very simple Minster type wage regression and we proxy this basically because we don't see the, the willingness to provide flexibility directly. So we proxy it simply by the share of male applicants uh, for, the, for the particular job, okay? And Two we, more minutes, Ben. We, we put that in to the simple wage regression. Uh, of course, controlling for a very large set of controls. And the result is that, that here on the left-hand side, we these are five different specifications. On the left-hand side, this is kind of the initial residual earnings gap in our data. This is 14 or 15%. But once we control, once we add the share of male applicants to any of this specification, it 
it goes down for any in any of these specifications. And if you calculate it, it's about six, up to 60%, uh, the decrease in the, in the gender earnings gap uh, by putting in the, the share of male applicants. Um, good, uh, I skipped that for the sake of time because I wanna show you this one. So here, uh, remember the, the illustration of the non-linear versus linear production function uh, thing in our model. And I showed you that uh, if you, if you choose the linear production function at, at the very low tail of, of, of input levels, it's, it generates higher output than the nonlinear one, okay? So that means that if, you, if you're not willing to provide flexibility, but under some, some circumstances that you end, at, end up in the nonlinear job, you get a discount, right? According to our model. And this is kind of what, what you can see here for mothers, okay? So here I, I and this is realized matches. So I'm, I'm, I'm calculating, I'm estimating the, the wage discount, the wage penalty for mothers over a grid of different shops of, of, of where the applicant pool had diff, uh, different shares of males, okay? And for the, for the situations where the women faced a very large share of male applicants, uh, but, but got a job in the end, uh, uh, that, that there's mothers that, that have a high penalty. Uh, and this is super consistent with this theory that, that Claudia Golden uh, has in mind and that I showed you at the very beginning. So uh, the discount is not, not so large for, for non-mothers. Uh, and this is all in reference to, to our males. Um, we also have results for commuting distance. Uh, basically the story is that the commuting distance is increasing with the wage, wage premium. Uh, this is uh, the case for all, all the three groups, but uh, it's the level is largest for males, meaning that they have the, the, the highest commuting distance as compared to non-mothers in mothers. Uh, yes, let me conclude really quick. I mean, we see that uh, there are uh, large differences in the application behaviors, especially at high and, and low paying firms. We think this is associated with uh, larger employer side flexibility requirements at this high wage firms and, and shops. Uh, I showed you that it seems to be quantitatively important. Uh, it explains a lot of the residual gender earnings gap in Germany. Uh, well, the question is then, can we get rid of, of this? And I mean, this is up for discussion, uh, but uh, the model and, and the, the results that I showed you would, would suggest that a change in public childcare and a change in, in maybe the intra-family allocation would, uh, would help but we also saw that in the last year, job requirements uh, went down for some jobs. This is, I mean, this is also has the pot potential to, to change or to get more females into this high paying job, I would say. Yeah, I stop here. Thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot, Benjamin. The floor is open for comments, questions, discussion. Any questions, comments from the participants here? <laughs> I mean, if I have more time, I can show you another result. <laughs> yeah, sure, as long as um, there are no questions. Uh, well, but please interrupt can... me if you have a question. I mean, what, what, what we have here is basically here, we, we are conditioned on on females hired. So we, we only interested in if if the in the end the female got the job, is it a case that this mechanism also holds? And we uh, I mean we 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 basically before we had a continuous share of male applicants and now we, we create categories out of that. And the, the reference category is like a, a medium share of males. And and here we conditioning on, on female hired, we also see that if there's a a high share of males compared to a medium share of males, females get more, earn a higher wage. So this speaks like, I mean, this speaks again in favor of this, this non-linear reduction function because these, these females could be the, the one that are willing to provide the flexibility. Um, yes. Great. 
Great, thanks. Any questions or comments? And if you're interested in the data, I make uh, um, in the beginning of next year, I made them publicly available. So the linkage between the job vacancy survey and the admin data, and people can apply during the um, uh, data center to work with the data. Great. So if anybody's interested, they can reach out to you, Ben Red. Perfect. I think uh, thanks a lot, Ben. This was uh, very interesting indeed. Um, perfect. So then we can move on uh, to the next uh, paper from uh, Zeng uh, from the University of Southern California uh, on uh, labor market regulations and female labor force participation, new cross country evidence. The floor is yours. Okay. So thank you for having me. I'm a PhD student from University of Southern California. And this is a joint work with Professor Campus from UCL and also Professor Nugent from USC. Um, so we welcome to all comments and suggestions because this study is basically on the preliminary stage. So um, the roadmap for the presentation is that first I will introduce some background and our motivation and also some of the baseline results. And then we will go through the data description and also the empirical method. So finally, I will quickly conclude and maybe lead to the topic of discussions. So um, the motivation is that we found since 2000, um, there are considerable changes in female labor force participation across countries. So as you can see from this picture, we, we plot the world uh, and also regional average for the uh, gender labor force participation rates. So for all the darker areas, those are the labor force participation rate for female. And also for the um, shadow regions, those are the labor force participation rate for male. And um, so as we you, you can see that starting from 2000, uh, two, uh, sorry, 2000, so there is a pretty stable trend for the female labor participation rates. Also, there are kind of different uh, cross regions. So the female labor participation rate for the world average is almost almost 50%, while it is less than a, a quarter for the Middle East. And also when we compare about the gender gaps in terms of the labor force participation rates, we, sh we, we found the gender gap is narrowing down except in the Middle East and some countries in, from South Asia. And so it seems like and also we found like, it seems like governments have designed the labor market reforms, but without giving the female labor participation much thought. Although uh, in the current stage, it is hard for the economic series to totally explain or evaluate the effectiveness of, the female, of those labor reforms on the labor market. It is also very important for us to understand the effects of those reforms, especially on female labor participation rates and also provide guidance for further reforms for certain economies. So this leads to our uh, research questions. So how do labor regulation reforms reframe the employment and also labor participation decisions? And are, those, are, are there any heterogeneities across countries with different background and also economic characteristics? So uh, what we do in this paper is basically we set up, a, we use the annual panel data on labor regulations uh, from both developing and also developed countries. So those data set for most of the countries starts from 1970 and ends up uh, 2013. So we record significant reforms in three type of, types of labor market regulations where I will introduce details. So we, adopt the diff in diff, but with heterogeneity, heterogeneous, and also with studies of intertemporal and also dynamic treatment effects across these countries. Now I will quickly go through the preview of the main results. We found that when the countries adopt a higher uh, labor, re labor regulations, that will increase the relative female labor participation rate, basically is measured by the relative ratio between female and male labor force participation rates by 1.7% more than the countries that they do not adopt such reforms. 
if we consider the reforms by different uh, directions, the overall loosening in employment forms will increase the relative female labor participation rate by 5%, while the overall loosening working times will decrease the relative female participation rate by 6%. But we didn't find any significant results in male labor participation rates or the labor uh, or just uh, unemployment. So uh, let me jump to the data part. So we will use the main data set is the CBR labor regulation index. So this is a world a worldwide measurement of the labor laws in uh, 117 countries starting from 1970s to 2013. So the index ranges between one and zero, where, where zero measures there's a flexible labor regulations, and one means the labor regulations are very tight in those countries. So there are totally five subsidies recorded, but today we will just go through the first three, which are the different forms of long employment, working time, and dismissal. So in this map, I plot the labor regulations across the countries at the end of the data set. So as you can see from this graph, those blank areas are not covered by the data set. While the darker areas means that those countries are having a strict labor, re labor regulations and shadow areas meaning that the labor regulations are pretty flexible. So we found, and also we found a uh, difference across different labor um, regulations. For example, we found that when we come to the labor regulations um, related to the working time and auto dismissal, usually we think Europe and China has the most strict um, regulations on that. And also North America used to be the most flexible ones. So this is just a preview of the data. And we also used the data, labor market data, such as unemployment from World Bank and IMF uh, especially, we also consider about the shadow economy from the data sets. Okay, so since we have a frequent um, labor reforms through these years, so that will add up to our calculation difficulties. So we identify the labor reforms. So here, we use the indicator PIT equals to one if country I adopts a positive labor regulation reforms at time T, and we use NIT to denote the dummy variable where country I adopts a negative labor regulation reforms at time T. And also we discard labor reforms with changes smaller than a certain threshold and exclude repetitive reforms in the same direction. For example, if a country that uh, adopts two or more, uh, two or more positive reforms three, three years in a row, then we only consider the most uh, important one or the earliest one. And also we exclude small reforms in the opposite directions to uh, discard those changes with policy reversions. So using the above criteria, we discard about 25% of the reform in the CBR data set, which improves our efficiency and also the identification accuracy in our uh, method. So here I will introduce you briefly the uh, QA fix effect model that we adopt. So YIT here is a log gender uh, dependent variable of interest, which is a log gender spec a specified labor force participation rate and also unemployment rate in country I at time T. And here we use DIT to denote the dummy variables indicating the treatment. And delta I and gamma T controls for the time and also country fixed effect. And we include GDP per capita, common loss dummy variables, shadow economy, and lagged in unemployment as control variables. Finally, we adopt the diff in diff designs with multiple groups and periods, which allow us to use continuous treatments and also with staggered time settings. So um, I think due to time limits, I will just show you some of the uh, significant and also important uh, results from at the current stage. So first, we in this in um, in this graph, you will see the effects of the of all these three kind of labor regulations on the relative force uh, female labor force participation rate. 
So here I want to introduce you is that on the left, to, to the left of the zero axis, you will see the placebo estimates using the pre-treatment data. And to the right of time zero, we show the dynamic and inter, uh, temporal treatment effects. So we found that for the forms of employment at time t equals to zero, basically at, at the um, instantaneous effect, which is about 1.7% increase in the female labor participation rate, and this effect goes to significant at 10% level and goes to 3 or 5% at one year or two years later. However, we didn't find that the reforms in working time or dismissal will change the female labor participation rate. And then we focus on the forms of employment to study the pure, change, pure positive or negative reforms in the labor regulations. So here, let me show you this a result. So on the left hand, on, on this left graph, you can see that there is a tiny or the positive re uh, reforms on the employment forms. That is saying that during the uh, during the total duration of the time period that we observe, those countries are having an overall positive changes in their labor regulations. And on the right hand side, when there is a loosening, we found that those countries are actually adopting overall negative changes on their labor regulations. So what we found here is that these effects from the changes in the employment forms are mainly driven by the loosening. So when the loosening or when the regulation are loosening by one, there is a 5.2 in per percent increase in the relative female labor participation rate. However, this result is, is totally different from the working time. So when we separate the positive and negative reforms on the working time, we found that there is a significant instantaneous effect on the, uh, on the first year of the negative change in working time. Those means that when the working time regulation become more flexible, females are relatively less likely to attend jobs. So we also conduct a robustness check using the absolute levels of pre female labor participation rates and found a similar trends for those uh, estimations. So here, let me wrap up. What we found is that we use the DID with multiple periods and reforms with continuous treatment. We found potential short-term effects of forms of unemployment on female labor participation rates. And also we found significant positive effects from, uh, from the change in employment forms and also negative effects from loosening the regulations in working time. However, we didn't find significant effects on the total employment or female or, or male female uh, labor participation rates. So uh, since we're still on the uh, first stage of this study, we have some future plans so one of these is that we want to identify maybe the potential mechanisms that lead to the difference and also heterogeneity across gender labor, uh, labor force participation rates. And also we want to explore the heterogeneity across countries using the uh, maybe more or a more accurate identification method. So yeah, I think that's, all I have for the presentation, and we welcome any comments and also questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheng. Um, so the floor is open for comments, questions, discussion, recommendations. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Angelica. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I was just wondering when you were showing the uh, well, the, the graphs also for labor force participation, um, but mm -hmm. but uh, in the in the regressions, I was thinking, have you actually included the education lab? Because also uh, what has increased throughout the years also the educational attainment of women in particular. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking whether you know including the human capital, the uh, for example the proportion in tertiary education. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because that would be also important, uh, you know, factor explaining the labor force participation uh, behind the increase in labor force participation, particularly for women. Thank you. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for your question and suggestion. So, so far we didn't, we have not increased the, uh, uh, sorry, we haven't included the education level um, in this setting, but I think um, somehow this education change can be covered by the time fixed effects. Yeah, so, and also we, st we hope to include maybe the different, the gender gaps in terms of education here. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Right. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes, yeah, the time effect, but uh, it's also country specific, right? Or region specific, yes. actually. So, yes. so the interaction may be mm, mm -hmm. between the time and the, uh, the region. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank but, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. Just a short, yeah. short, short question on, on your uh, why variable, uh, the endogenous variable. You're looking, this is unemployment or is this labor force participation? Um, here, so we um, so we run a set of estimations on a set of dependent variables, YIT here. But what I showed here today due to time limits, I only show the relative female labor participation rate, which is the um, female labor participation rate uh, over the male labor participation rate. So it's the relative level of female labor participation rate in the oh, oh, Okay, but it also depends on, on, on comparable. I mean, on comparable, you have to yeah. make uh, the, the, you have to match the right people to the right people, which can be very challenging. Yes, I mean, uh, because female, I mean, different jobs, different uh, work, working time and so on. So, so mm -hmm. I was interested yeah. more in the, I mean, I know we cannot in such, in a few seconds have, uh, a complete picture of all your project, but I was just curious to see how differentiated, mm -hmm. and that would be my question, how differentiated your analysis is in terms to, uh, to, to, to the objective of female uh, equality in the labor force. Now it could be just, I mean, being having a job at all or having a kind of job, maybe a, a stable job or a, a flexible job uh, or a part-time part -time work and so on, because this makes uh, uh, when we come to female employment, it, it, it's much more complex than this, this male employment as you know. So, so is this just yeah. one variable you're looking at or is this more complex? Um, so far at this stage, we only look at the first uh, simple indicator for the female labor participation rate. Yeah. Um, I'm, I actually uh, think it is very useful to follow your suggestions to look into like maybe more um, detail like the equality, like what kind of job or the industry specifications. But one challenge is that we don't have such a very micro foundation data. So what we have so far is basically a macro level data. So if we have, or you have any suggestion that we can have like a specific country or like firm level that data, I think that will be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, country specific, details about uh, what's what's going on in these countries. Of course, you, you take this out with dummies, or I mean, that's you have time series. Uh, so if you have a country specific dummy, you take out, uh, let's say, large differences across countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, I mean, you have a, you, uh, or do you, you, you is it the I, is it, is it the delta I or whatever in your regression takes out country specific differences is this right mm -hmm. yeah yeah so then you yeah, yeah. okay so you're saying you cannot use macro indicators of uh, diff okay well yeah yeah okay it's a it, yeah it, it's thank you very much it, I, it's all what i wanted to know thanks yeah thank you so much for your suggestion any final comments or questions Otherwise, uh, thanks very much, Cheng. Thank you. For your presentation. So we are um, kind of six minutes late, so uh, apologies for that. But please, I would, of course, be grateful if you um, stay with the session uh, because we'll have now our final paper in this uh, session uh, from Anne Loire. Uh, she's with the Labour Market Information Council in Canada and also affiliated with uh, Pop at U Numerit and the GLO. And the topic is measuring labour and skills shortages using online job posting data in Canada. So, Anne-Loire, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, it's really early in Canada, but I'm really happy to be here to talk about um, this new project that we have. Um, and I'm also really happy, um, really glad to see that my colleague Kashyap could join us also, even though it's really early. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, so this is, I took a risky choice here presenting uh, this project. Uh, it is very, very preliminary. Um, but as you see in the presentation, we kind of know where we want to go, but we are not sure how. And I'm actually really interested to uh, hear your comments and questions. So I'll try to run through the slides as quickly as possible. We'll see how much time that takes. Um, so as you might or might not know, um, there are some increasing concerns about labor shortages in Canada. Right now, the number of job vacancies is around 1 million. Um, and there are important labor shortages in sectors such as health, accommodation and food services, sales, etc. etc. And that's really disrupting economic activity. And for the efficient matching of workers to jobs, workers need information on where job opportunities are emerging. Vacancies, information on vacancies is an important labor market information for workers. Um, and it measures the unmet demand for labor. And vacancies, when used um, in uh, the ratio of vacancies over unemployed workers, it's a measure, one of the measure of labor shortages. In Canada, vacancy data is, uh, we get vacancy data from JVWS, that's an official survey from the government. It does provide uh, reliable information, but there are certain limitations, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and next to that, we have online job posting data, uh, which could complement vacancy data to measure real time unmet demand for labor and uh, labor or skills shortages. So the idea here is really, the objective here is really how to use big data to find a solution uh, to a, a current uh, labor market challenges. First, I'll briefly talk about the, the official data, the JVWS. So it's a firm level survey that's collected by Statistics Canada. It was introduced in February 2015, and it's a quarterly release. We have monthly data available, but only since October 2020, and it's not, uh, I mean, we only have uh, the monthly data by sector for all of Canada or only by province and territories. It's a stock data of a certain point in time. The target is all business locations operating in Canada that have more than one paid employee. And it uses the business register to generate a sample of about 100,000 businesses in Canada. Most importantly, it excludes certain employers, um, religious organizations, private households, international and extraterritorial public administrations, and federal, provincial, and territorial administrations. So this data, it does provide very good, very reliable information on vacancies in Canada, but there are certain limitations. And first of all, uh, it's quarterly released. So that means that there's a time lag. There's three months time lag before the data is published. So we cannot actually use this data to inform uh, real-time policy decisions. Second, um, well, it's a survey, it's a sample of um, minus than 10% of total number of employers. So this makes it impractical to study vacancies at very detailed uh, local or occupational level. Also because um, there's some um, data suppression because of confidentiality reasons. Then the JVWS data, it includes existing and anticipated job vacancies but anticipated vacancies might never materialize. There's, some, so, there's also some concerns about sampling and non-sampling errors because it is a survey. And as I've mentioned, uh, federal, provincial, and territorial administration jobs are not included in the sample, which means that 5% of employment, uh, which is 5% of employment in Canada, that is not included uh, in this sample. Um, and these jobs also include a considerable number of management occupations. So this is creating a certain bias. Then we have um, our um, 
source of online job posting data, which is vicinity jobs. This is data that we buy uh, from this company. It's a big data analytics and internet search uh, Canadian company that uses natural language processing techniques to collect daily information on new online job postings from hundreds of French and English websites across Canada. It's available since January 2018. We receive approximately 200,000 new unique job postings uh, each month. So this means that this is a flow of data. And we receive an update uh, weekly, but we have access to daily uh, information. They use uh, deduplication methods for postings that appears on several websites. And we have an estimation of 95% of uh, duplicated uh, online job postings that are removed. The information that's available, um, we have for 85% of online job posting, we can tie it to an, a certain occupation. For 50% of online job posting, we can tie it to a certain industry. We have a geographical location for 95% of online job postings. And we also have information on the skills required, which is very interesting if we want, if we want to move into uh, measuring skills shortages in the future. Uh, but this presentation is focused on labor shortages. Um, we also have information on education required, the job uh, type, the duration, the data source, uh, the experience required, the language of the posting, and also the uh, required language. So there are three main advantages of using online job postings um, as a proxy for vacancies. First, well, the data is near real time. We receive an um, weekly update, but we actually have access to uh, the daily information. The observations are also available for very small geographies. So we could uh, do this analysis at very small uh, geographical level, which is not possible with the official vacancy data. And we also have information, uh, lots of uh, very uh, interesting information, such as uh, the employer information. Um, we have the potential to track user information. We have the offered wages, the required education and certification skills requirement, and et cetera. But um, caution is needed when using online job posting data as a proxy for uh, vacancies and as a measure for unmet labor demands. And first of all, well, online job postings and vacancies, they refer to distinct concepts. There are two different indicators. Not all vacancies are posted online, and each online job posting might not represent a current vacancy. Each online job posting may also contain one or more vacancies. Second, we actually do not have access to the, the algorithm that was put in place by this company, Vicinity Jobs. It's close to public scrutiny. Then the deed application of online job postings, while it's quite good, I'd say it's not perfect. There are 95% of duplicates that are removed, which means that 5% of observations are counted a double. Not all online job postings can be captured because there are certain websites that use technology to prevent third-party monitoring. For example, LinkedIn. So no uh, online job postings for LinkedIn are included in this data. And not all online job posting can be matched to an occupation, an industry, or even a location. This uh, creates uh, a certain bias. This means that online job postings are biased towards certain occupation sectors, uh, jobs and uh, locations. For example, uh, it's more likely that um, uh, an employer looking for a management position will post it online. Um, and it's less likely that a smaller enterprise in the agricultural sector, for example, posts it online. So this, there is a certain bias using online job posting data. This is, the, um, this is just a plot comparing the count of online job postings in orange and in black, we have the count of official vacancies. So on, on average, uh, online job postings are 46,000 higher than the number of vacancies. Um, but looking at this plot, you see that something, um, there was something happened during the, the pandemic month. So, um, just just for your information, the the black lines is, was discontinued during um, 
the pandemic. So this is why there, there are some missing data there. But we also see that the fit becomes actually uh, better after the pandemic month. But we still see this difference. Some of the potential sources for this difference could be, well, first of all, we're comparing stock and flow data. Second, there's a time lag with JVWS. There's also some conceptual differences between uh, online job postings and vacancies. There's a deduplication issue um, and uh, public administration jobs are not included in JVWS, et cetera, et cetera. This plot um, just looks at the ratio of online job postings over vacancies. And this is what I was telling you about. So the, before the pandemic, before the, the missing data, the ratio was um, positive. So we have uh, an average difference of 127,000 between online job postings and vacancies before the pandemic. And this difference de decreased to uh, minus uh, 58,000. So it became negative, but it also became a lot smaller. We are not sure what happened. Um, this could have been caused by a change in methodology. For example, maybe um, um, they have improved their deduplication um, algorithm. Uh, maybe there was a change in data sources, which means that the methodology used by vicinity job has uh, become as improved and online job postings are closer to vacancies. They might also have been a change in employer behavior, maybe some employer post more online, um, online um, now that the pandemic has happened. Has there been a change in employment composition? So during the pandemic, a lot of, um, a lot of workers stopped working and they used this time to train and change careers. So the change, there was a change in employment composition and posting online um, is tied to the, the type of sector, the probability of posting online is tied to the sector of activity and the type of occupation. A last um, cause would be that during the pandemic, people were laid off. This has created vacancies, but this has not created online job postings because these people just came back um, to their job without the need for an online job posting. We could disaggregate um, by province, which is what we did here. And what we see is that there's um, an important variation um, between the different provinces. Um, yeah, I have this. So we, we do see the kind of the same trend. So the, the, this is the ratio again of online job posting over vacancies. We see the kind of the same trend for every province except Prince Edward Island. So there's a decrease, um, the, the ratio is decreasing. Two we minutes. have thought, thank you. Um, we have thought about using um, the data on occupation, but um, it's not yet. Um, we feel that the, there's too much missing information at the moment. So our idea is uh, just looking at the provinces right now. So if there are two minutes, I will skip this. I'll just say something about this plot. This is. Um, this is just looking at the growth rates between online job postings and vacancies. What you see here is the time lag, but I just wanted to point to the fact that the fit, the fit is actually very good. Um, yeah, and again, like the, we're still comparing flow to stocks, uh, but the, the, the fit between the two series of, is very good. So finally, this is um, this is like the very, very initial idea that we have. And this is just us uh, throwing some ideas in the slides. Um, what we would like to come up with is a way of uh, measuring labor shortages and um, coming up with a proxy for vacancies using online job posting data. The idea would be, for example, to have the prediction of uh, online job posting for a certain month. Here I have uh, November. Um, so using these online job posting data that we would be adjusting at each uh, new release of JVWS, we adjust it for um, general trend, a long-term trend, maybe obtained through um, a regression of online jo job postings using months as an independent variable and then adjusting it further with a certain ratio that would uh, compensate for the bias of online job posting with regard to vacancies. 
Here we could include our seasonality component. We could break down this prediction for uh, different provinces or smaller geographical locations or by occupation code when the quality is improved and we have less missing data. We could add an adjustment factor um, or a ratio for any other relevant independent uh, variable that we find in our econometrics model. And we could also reassess the model each month, each, um, each time that we have um, online job posting, a new online job posting, but we also could reassess at each new uh, release of JVWS um, each new quarter. So I think I'll stop here. And um, I'm hoping there's still time because I'm really interested to hear about your comments and what you think of this topic. This is uh, very different, very new for us. We don't know the literature very well. Um, here I have two questions um, to, to kind of direct your comment, but uh, very happy to take any questions or comments that you have. Great, thanks a lot, Andrea. So let's open the floor for questions, comments, or answers to these questions. Klaus. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, a quick, quick intervention first. I mean, there is a big literature on online job search, yes, and uh, you have to in inspect that. Um, and a lot of work uh, is done by Peter Kuhn and his uh, Chinese co author, uh, who has produced lots of uh, top published papers in quarterly journal of economics and so on. Um, so that's one, one maybe one indication. And the other thing you have well described uh, what uh, what what the situation is, and it's interesting uh, that there is this, this correlation uh, still because uh, by re by rational by thinking uh, one would already predict that uh, the number of vacancies reported by companies or, uh, or documented by their search uh, is, is is higher than the registered uh, by the traditionally registered. Um, vacancies because you can be much more more flexible uh, uh, with with the ideas uh, you you may fill a certain demand for work uh, in different ways and and it could be different alternative settings of characteristics which would would make this package so so if you can easily advertise uh, that yeah okay if if this is um if this is uh, true then maybe as a number of vacancies reported uh, by a company might be of interest to, to look at and also the diversity of uh, the jobs they are searching for as an indicator perhaps uh, to see um, uh, what is really behind uh, that that would be my uh, initial, initial ideas. Good luck with this uh, <laughs> challenging project. Thanks. So by diversity, uh, what do you mean exactly? What, what are you? Well, you can say I want a cleaning woman and a computer expert. Yes, that's very, that's very diverse. Yes. Um, but you can, or, or job specific, I want somebody who says hello to the people who come in into the job and the other is is, 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 is showing how a machine works or something like that. Yes, that, that would be, it could be just one person doing both and uh, 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 a person is still, so this, are, this is a diversity of job, jobs. Mm -hmm. Yes, the mm -hmm. final breakdown yes. uh, of uh, the tasks, or I mean more task related, yes, how different tasks, how, how task yes. specific are the, these jobs and if a company asks in the same kind of category for five or seven or, or ten different tasks that would be different from just saying i want one person who deals with the whole package mm, yes so i didn't have time to address this in in this presentation but online job posting they do have all of the skills requirement um grouped uh, like grouped in uh in, in skills uh, so this this would enable us to measure skills shortages, which is something that it's uh, is not possible right now with the official data. Um, so there are two opportunities here to measure labor shortages and what your your uh, what you were just saying, uh, like uh, this this whole new um, topic of measuring skills and skills shortages. That's uh, also like uh, something we would like to work um on in the future with this data so um thank you thank you for your comment that that makes a lot of sense any further comments questions suggestions from the participants
does not look like. So then uh, thanks a lot, and Laura. Well, for thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Sure. No problem. Great. I think um, this has been a very rich uh, uh, and uh, uh, interesting, uh, interesting and also very stimulating session here at the uh, GLO Global Conference. As mentioned, um, we organized this uh, session uh, from POP, the Center um, for Population Development and Labor Economics at UNU Merit. And um, so I would like to, first of all, thank the uh, presenters very much for uh, your uh, really engaging uh, presentations uh, and for being here and uh, on a Saturday presenting your work. I think that has been very valuable uh, to all the participants for all your comments. And uh, of course, then um, to the a GLO, uh, different teams who have been organizing that uh, together with Klaus. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, opportunity. Yeah, and thanks to, to Alessio and of course all the presenters and uh, speakers. And um, well, I can also recommend the next session in half an hour will will deal with this China in the world. <laughs> it will be very a very fascinating session also like this one. So I enjoyed and I learned a lot and uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, let me close uh, the recording. Thanks. <laughs>